here we are, lecture 10 in our lecture series, um, and we have been through the previous uh, nine lectures, we have been doing mostly formal uh, development of quantum field theory, right? We have been looking at the free scalar field and, and, and we saw that we can define some objects which are causal and will be useful later. So, in this lecture, what we want to do is to take a few steps forward, right? So, we're skipping forward in that development to take a look at what the observables for those theories will be, right? That's a, a bit of a leap. So, for instance, if you're following uh, um, Nastasi's book, you see that we, we're skipping now all the way to section 19, even Peskin, there's a little jump there. But I think that's a useful thing to do at this point, because the next thing we'll do in our formal development is to look at theories with interactions. And there's a lot of um, assumptions we'll make uh, of what the observables are in order to direct our calculations towards those observables. So I think it is useful at this point to know what the observables will be before you start gearing your calculations towards them. Right? Uh, the flip side is that um, to define those observables, we'll have to assume we already know some things about the formal structure of the theory. Right, which will be just the ad hoc information at this point. So, the way to 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 look at this lecture is, is there will be some some affirmations I will make about how the the, the structure of the theory uh, that you have to accept at this point. We will eventually get there once we go back to the formal development, and focus right now on what. The observables are. I mean, what kind of experiment do you want, at least minimally, to describe with these theories? And that's what we're looking at, and 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 we we'll use later this as a guide, so that we, when we go back to the development or the formal aspects of the theory, we know what we're looking for. Right? What are what are the 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 objects we want to calculate that will really matter to the observables? So let's uh, let's uh, start, and we we first want to define what a cross section is. Imagine the following situation: we have two bunches, I would say, of particles flying towards each other. Right? This may be just a particle accelerator accelerating uh, bunches against against bunches. Maybe a target where you're throwing uh, particles at. Of course, this is just a change of uh, reference frame. It may be even quasi-particles in the material, right? What, in, what is important, I have a certain number of excitations of a field and another certain number of excitations, and they are moving in opposite directions, and they will cross each other, right? When they cross, um, what I am assuming here is that the density in bunch A and bunch B is low enough that uh, first, the chance of one particle hitting another, a number of particles in, in the other bunch is small, right? So usually there's one interaction or even none, right? And also the interaction between particles in each bunch is, is, is negligible. So I'm, I'm, um, essentially the, the interaction strength between particles in a bunch is very small compared to to the energies involved uh, when when something actually happens. So if one of these particles in one bunch scatters another one, it's basically scattering a free particle because whatever is connecting these particles with others in the bunch is negligible compared to the force of the of the impact, right? <clears throat> and so essentially, I'm thinking about gases of of particles, right? And now these bunches will cross each other, right? The, the important parameters for me here are, are many, right? So, I'm defining rho A and rho B, oops, rho A and rho B as the densities 
in bunch A and bunch B, which are assumed to be small. Uh, another important parameter for my impact is the actual intersection between those bunches. They are uh, both bunches are finite in size, right? Uh, but they don't need to be aligned, so there is an effective area that will cross. And since I'm assuming the, inter the internal interaction is small, whatever is outside that uh, area that actually passes through is not important, right? So a will be the interaction area and of course it's it's also important how long they will be overlapping right occupying the same space so the interaction uh, length along this direction they are moving is important too right? so under the assumption that the density is small the interactions are small i can basically linearize in all these parameters right i can take the linear version of this 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 um, uh, this situation and write the number of events that happen. Suppose I'm doing this again and again, right? And I want to know um, uh, what's the probability of actually one particle in bunch B and one particle in bunch A interact and they will actually scatter instead of they just going through each other with no particles in interacting. I want to know the chance that two of them interact. And I'll, I'll measure that in terms of the number of events that happen, right? And, and, and each time it crosses, right? And, and, and that in the linear version where these densities are small and, and internal interactions can be ignored, of course, it's proportional to all, all these quantities, right? Because the bigger the density, the more important, uh, the the bigger the chance of uh, of something happening, right? Uh, of course, the the larger the intersection area, the larger the chance, and of course, also the same is true for the length, right? And as long as these densities are small and interactions are small, I can take this to depend linearly in in all these quantities, right? And the number of events uh, that happen once they cross will be proportional to all of them. This constant of proportionality is what I call a cross section. So we'll define cross section as the proportion between the number of events and all these quantities right here. So you see, all geometry is is included in the in these uh, in these quantities. So, given the same geometry, what will make a, a different uh, situations have different cross section is something intrinsic to how these particles interact. Right? So if I say these particles, we have some intuition there, right? If I say, for instance, that these, these particles and these ones, they only interact with each other through gravity, say. And we know gravity is a very weak force for a small number of uh, particles, for, for small mass, right? The cross-section is expected to be very small, right? They will just go through each other with almost no events occurring. Now, if I say that these are all charged particles and electric charge, say there are electrons on both sides, then you expect the cross section, same geometry, same number of particles, same length, same area, everything is the same. But now they they have uh, electric repulsion, right? There are ele electrons on both sides. I expect the number of events to be much bigger than if it was just gravity. So the cross section uh, uh, is a combination of these two factors, but you see, there, there is something intrinsic to different theories that will influence this cross-section beyond what geometry uh, uh, tells us, right? Also, we can do some dimensional analysis here and see uh, what's the dimension of, of this cross-section that I define, right? So, number of events has no dimensions, right? so it's just one. This is a volume, so length minus three, another volume. This is area, right? So L 
square. And these are just lengths, so L, L, right? If you put these all together, it will be just L square, right? So this is a minus six, four here, minus two. So, uh, so cross section has a dimension of area, right? And and there is an interpretation you can have of that, right? This is basically the if you take one of the particles, say in bunch A, and another one is coming from bunch B, this is the area around this particle. You can imagine a, a circle around particle A in a plane perpendicular to the direction of particle B. Right? This is the area in which particle B must pass effectively to interact. Right? And, and, and of course, that depends on the strength of interaction. Right? Short range interactions allow particles to, to pass very, really close to each other and, 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 uh, and not interact. While strong interactions, long, uh, especially long uh, range interactions, will you give me a big cross section for the same geometry. Right? So that's why this is, has dimensions of area. Of course, this is a simplified uh, interpretation because it's using geometry that is a classical idea of trajectories. We, we, we just defining this in a way that is completely uh, equivalent, uh, I mean, completely compatible with quantum mechanics here, right? All, the only geometric parameters that are entering are micro, micro, macroscopic ones, right? So these macroscopic parameters can always be defined, but sigma will depend on the quantum behavior of the theory too, right? And it's completely compatible with that. There's another way I can define this uh, cross-section just to give us a, a better understanding of it, which is imagine now there's a point like target and I, I'm using a beam, a string of particles, and I'm throwing this, this beam of particles in that point like target. And imagine the point like target has some, some potential, right? And I'm, I'm looking now at the probability that this string of incoming particles will produce events. Again, I'm defining event as a scattering. Something happens. Just going through is not an event. Right? And, and now you can see the target is just a point. It's a little bit different than before where both bunches were some density. Now there's just one point and I'm throwing a density at it. Right? And this being can be characterized by a flux, right? I just, uh, I can write the flux of the incoming beam, right? As the number of particles in the beam, number of uh, particles per area per time, right? This will be a flux. Mm -hmm. And I can characterize uh, the scatterings by the number of events the total number of events, right? Let's call delta n event, right? Now, again, I expect that if nothing else changes, the number of events per time will be proportional to this flux, right? If I increase the flux either by making the beam tighter or uh, increasing the number of uh, particles in it, uh, I expect that the number of scatterings will increase, right? The more flux I have in my beam, right? Now, again, I can define a constant of proportionality between these two things, which I'll call cross-section. Now we have to later see what's, relation, what's the relation between this definition I'm using now and the previous one, which was for a different situation, where right? you had uh, also a density in the target. Now my target is just a point. Right? But still, let's look at how this constant of proportionality looks, right? It will be delta n events over time over the flux, right? And let's rewrite this in a convenient way. I just plug in the definition of flux. Down here, I can get rid of time, right? And, and uh, this will be just number of events over number of in, uh, incoming particles over area, right? This right here is the 
area density of the beam, right? If I take uh, cross, uh, I cut the beam uh, perpendicular to the, the direction where the particles are flying, I have a, a density of the beam, which I'll call NB, right? Little n means area density, right? And, and, and that's one form I can write this cross-section, right? This cross-section. We can also rewrite the flux in a more convenient way. Right, let me take the definition of the flux, bring it down here, right? And I want now to compare with the previous one, right? Where I had a density. So this, this beam of particles has some volumetric density, right? Number of particles per volume. Right? And I need to figure out which the volume is. So of course the volume is proportional to the area times a length, right? And the length that crosses the target during time t is proportional to the speed of the particles within the, the, the beam, right? So imagine I have the target here, the bunch, the beam is passing through. The length that defines this volume is just speed times the time in the volume takes to cross the target, right? And, and that allows me, let me repeat, area times dot t here, right? allows me to write the flux just as volumetric density times speed, which is useful. Now let, let's try to compare this cross-section to the previous one, right? Now I want to make the target, uh, write that bunch A, which is my target, uh, as just a superposition of many of these point-like targets that I have here, right? And define some uh, some cross-section, right? The, the, the number of particles in the target, the total number of now uh, point-like particles in the target is, of course, proportional to the density of particles in the target. And now I'm making, again, a cloud of point-like uh, target times the volume, right? This is the length A, the same I defined at the start, and area, again. And again, the area, now I can... Uh, interpret this area as the area of intersection between the two bunches because um, uh, the, the, the volume outside these intersecting volumes is, is, is not contributing, right? Because they don't interact strongly enough. Now, the cross-section in this case is defined, this is the cross-section to one part. So, in here I need to define the number of events per time per particle, right? Then I have equivalent thing when I have many particles instead of just one. I'm defining now the number of events per time per particle. So if I divide by n in this new case where I'm making many targets, I'm using the same definition I use for one target. Right? And that makes clear that this cross-section is, is the cross-section per particle. And of course there's the flux in here because uh, uh, is, is the proportionality between this number and this one, right? So, to, to get to the one particle target, I just divide by n, right? And now I can show that this definition is the same I used before, right? Uh, I can just um, use um, this uh, definition of the flux that I figure out here. So, uh, n is whole a L A A, right? The flux is just ho B times V. And up here I have uh, the number of events per time. Right? You see this um, delta t goes under here and combine delta t times v is just, right, delta t times v is just the length of, of the beam that passed through uh, the bunch A, right? So this is the LB I had before, so I can now bring this here and 
this delta t here gets together with this v to become lb, right? And I have the same definition I had before, right? Number of events, densities, lengths, and area in the bottom here. Exactly the same definition I have before. Right? So I'm talking really when you see that when I do that, I can see that that interpretation I told about the area around one particle in the target. Of course, this is totally symmetric. I'm making this difference between inciting and, and target, but you could just invert the whole thing and think in terms of one target in, in the bunch B, right? It's totally symmetric. But you see that this is really the cross-section per target that you can think as individual point-like uh, particles, and there's this cross-section for each one of them. Right? Same definition, same dimension. Of course, you could see already here that this has dim dimensions of area, right? This is dimensionless, dimensionless. There's area here, so that has dimension of area always. Right? And this is what we call the total cross-section. The reason we call this the total cross-section is that I'm either considering that event occurred or it didn't. I mean, the, the particles went straight through each other. But I'm not worried if the particle uh, uh, scattered, I, I say, in a 90-degree angle or, or, or a 45 or... Uh, what was the energy of the scattering, scattered particle. But of course, this has less information than if I actually cared about these distributions. Because, say, I could, I could have a theory that has a very high probability of scattering in 90 degrees. And another one that had the same total probability of having an event, but in which most events went, uh, I don't know, really close to the original being. And this is, or, or uh, uh, the same for energy, right? You could have a, a, pro, a theory that produces a lot of high energy particles coming out and another one that produces the uh, same number of total events, but at lower energy, right? And all these uh, variables, all these distributions will be predictions of my model, of my theory, right? So, of course, if I, 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 I look not only at the total number of events, but I also look how they are distributed in in space and in energy, right? Of course, that brings me more information and increases the predictive power of my of my theory. And uh, we have experiments that are designed like that, right? If you look at particle accelerators, or even if we go back to to Rutherford scattering, you were really looking at distribution. Right, and so uh, while the cross section is one of the observables we are interested in, the total cross section, we are also interested in, in differential cross section. So let's define that. Right, I, I, I want to define the idea of a cross section that actually depends on the distribution. So I can call a differential cross section. Right. Uh, something that depends on the various uh, momenta of the particles, uh, the outgoing par particles. So say there's the number n of outgoing particles. This, the, uh, this sigma is the differential cross-section, which is the chance of an event occurring. I mean, that constant of, uh, that, that proportionality constant I defined above, in a certain bin of three momenta, right? So, of course, momenta gives me not only the direction each particle is going, right? So I'm taking small beams uh, and, and, and also gives me the energy under one assumption that I'll make, I'm making here, which is I'm only caring about three momenta here because I'm assuming that if I know the three momenta and I know the mass of the particle, I know the energy. In other words, I'm assuming these scattered, these states that get to my detectors actually obey the relativistic dispersion relation, which I have to prove. I have to prove that for interacting theories, I prove that to, to free uh, theory. 
But I have to prove that in interacting theories, I have states that satisfy uh, the relativistic dispersion relation, at least in some limit, right? This is reasonable in the sense that all particles that we have observed in nature satisfy these this, this, uh, dispersion relations, but I have to prove that formally, so keep that in mind. Under that assumption, all I have to do is write this in terms uh, of these uh, three momenta of the final particles, right? And look at the distribution of the scattered particles. And then I know that the total cross-section is just the integral over all these momenta, right? And this is the differential one. Okay? A, a interesting uh, um, example, just to make this more definite, is to think of what we call the uh, scattering of two particles into two particles. So just to use the jargon we'll be using uh, a lot, this is the two, two, two scattering. So two initial particles, let me color the final ones a different color. And I have two final particles going out. So two incident particles, two outgoing particles. In this case, uh, my whole uh, final state is, is, is fixed by one pre-momenta of this particle, let's call this P1, and another one of these one, which is called P2. So I have a total of six variables. Again, under the assumption that if I know the pre-momenta, I know the energy. So the energy is not independent of the three momenta. The, the, the differential cross-section will be defined in terms of the differential towards the three momenta, not the, the four momenta. And so it's a total of six variables here, three momenta here, three momenta there, right? And of course, if I go to the initial, uh, I mean, if I use the, the reference frame of the center of mass for the initial two particles, the total three momenta initially is zero. I have some energy that I assume I know, right? So I have at least four Dirac deltas, right? I have three for the momenta. And I have another for energy, right? Oops, this is just one Dirac delta. So I can use those uh, four Dirac deltas to make uh, these six in, in, in principle independent variables into just two. Just two of them are really independent because I have conservation of energy and momenta to fix the other four in terms of these two, right? And one choice that we usually make, let's choose this direction, just you can choose any of them, right? And define an angle here between the, this particle and the initial one, right? And also an angle around around the beam, right, which are called phi. Right? And, and these two angles, right, I'm trying to draw a cone here around this, this uh, beam that comes from the right here. Right? These two angles, of course, define a solid angle. And, and, and then I can define a differential, which is d sigma d omega. Which has all the all the information in in this scattering. If I know this, this will be a function of these two angles, right? And then I know the probability of finding. And of course, if I know where this particle is, I also know where that one is by the conservation. Uh, and, and and this defines everything. So if my theory allows me to calculate that, right? I can make this experiment and test my model, test my theory, because this is unobservable. I just have to repeat these scatterings again and again and see what the probability is in each place, right? Of course, due to some limitations with my detectors, I might not be able to see particles really close for theta 180 or, or zero. There are some limitations, but in most of the space around this point where the collision happens, I can actually get this distribution and compare theory and experiment, right? So this is one clear observable. And of course, if I can look uh, 
almost everywhere I can get very close to the total cross section too, right? Not exactly the total one, but because you always lose something, but very close to it. And and this is uh, one of the observables we want to to get from quantum field theory. Another important observable that was very important at the very start of particle physics, which was born out of nuclear physics, right, was was the de decay rates, right? So the decay rate in the language we were uh, defining before is a one to n uh, process, right? So now I think about one particle, right, that it is, it is unstable for some reason, right? If left alone, eventually it will decay into a number of other particles, right? So that that's why one to n. I start with one and finish with two, three. I don't know how many particles as uh, uh, as many particles as this this one decays into, right? And again, I can define a, a proportionality constant, which depends now. Again, I'm assuming some level of uh, rarefaction, right? So I'm assuming the density. I have some material with a number of these unstable particles, right? And they are decaying. But I have to, to, to assume the density is small enough that I don't have chain reactions where each particle is decaying as if it was alone and, and, and not what happens, I don't know, in a nuclear reactor where one particle decays and actually the products of the decay hit the neighboring particle and stimulate it to decay too. Right? So I'm assuming this does not happen, so this is density is low enough, and in that case, I can say that the number of decays per unit of time, right, the number of decays per time is proportional to the number of particles in the material, right? The more particles I have, these unstable particles in that material, the more decays I'll have per, per time, right? And again, I can define a, cons a, a proportionality constant, which is just the number of decays over time divided by the number of particles. Right? And this I call uh, the decay rate of the decay width, right? And I can just, just write in this in a more uh, uh, convenient language, so this is the number of decays, and this is the number of particles in material, and this is time, right? Of course, the more they decay, right, that, that makes uh, every time a particle decays, that decreases the number of particles in the material, so what's varying is the number of particles in the material, so I can write it like this, and this is what I call the decay rate or equivalently the decay width. Right? And we know that many unstable particles have more than one mode of decay. So the pion, for instance, can decay into a mu and a neutrino, the mu neutrino, but it can also decay into an electron and uh, electron neutrino, right? There are two channels, so we call these channels of decay. Has the pion has more than one? There's others, even more rare than this one, that he can decay into. That also happens with uh, nuclear particles. That many many of them have more than one mode of decay. When that happens, it you can you can actually uh, it's very intuitive that the bigger this uh, decay rate is, the less time the particle will live, right? Because this is the probability at each given unit of time that will decay. If this is highly probable, it decays sooner and has a smaller lifetime. And this in all channels, so the more channels you have and the more probable those, those channels are, uh, the lower the lifetime. So I can define the half-life of the particle, right, this tau, as 1 over the sum of all widths. And here I summing over channels. This i runs 
all over all the channels the particle can decay into. And this is the same as the total decay wave, right? The, uh, so this sum of this partial width will give me the total width of the particle. And this is an observable, right? In fact, we know for from known relativistic uh, quantum mechanics that if you, you're doing a scattering between two particles, and these two particles have a bound state, which is not stable, right? Say these two particles get into the, these bound states and then decay a little afterwards, right? That will show up in the amplitude of the scattering of these two particles as a bright Wigner distribution. So the amplitude will be proportional to something like one over energy minus E0, and E0 is the energy of this bound state, plus I sigma over two, and sigma is the decay width of the bound of this unstable bound state, right? And then, then this density of probability of scattering, right? The cross section will be given by uh, E minus E zero square plus decay width square over four, right? So this is the energy I'm throwing these two particles in the center of mass. This is the peak of this this bright Wigner distribution, and this is the width of the bright Wigner distribution. And, it, and this will show up every time you're scattering two particles that have a bound state, right? So for instance, one experiment that where you can see this is when you bombard, you take neutrons, right? And you throw them into Indian uh, uh, nuclei, right? Indian is the 49 element, right? And this guy is capable of absorbing scattering uh, uh, neutrons, right? And, and the, if you look at the cross section, the plot of this, the cross section, right? This is the energy of the neutron, and this is the cross section. The plot will look something like this. So at first, you have some curve going down, which reflects the fact that at this region, right, the neutron is just going towards the indium. It's being scattered by it, right, and going to some other direction. And the probability goes down as you increase the energy of the neutron just because it gets harder and harder to deflect this neutron, right? But at some point here, the cross-section goes up and, and a peak appears. And there's another one after all. But this one, right, has a distribution, or the distribution of, around this peak looks like this one, right? And what's happening here? What's happening here is that uh, indium is it's composed of two isotopes, I think, it's 113 and, uh, and 115. Those are the two common in nature, right? And right about here, there's another one. I think it's it's a combination of the 14 and the 16, but I'm not sure of that. Right? But but there is possibility of producing an unstable. These two are basically this is unstable but long lived. Uh, it, it, to to produce a shorter lived unstable state of the indium, right? And then what really happens is the cross section goes up and, and an approximate intuitive image you can have of this is because now the neutron can spend some time orbiting the indium before it goes away. And that creates many more trajectories it could have before going out and the cross section goes up, right? Just because there's a resonance here. And the width of this resonance is the width of this indium isotope which I'm not sure what number is it, but it, it, there is an indium isotope here. And this is known for a long while, right? This happens also because just uh, because the bound state is, it's, it's, and the potential looks some something like this, right? And, and the energy in which these guys produce is around here. So it eventually tunnels out and, and decays, usually very fast to produce a peak like that. Right? So you can directly observe this width, and again, if your quantum field theory allows you to calculate this proportionality, 
which depends a lot on the interaction between these particles, you can compare that with experiment and, and get results, right? This is the non-relativistic version, but the same happens uh, in the relativistic version, right? So, for instance, uh, we have been doing uh, electron-positron uh, colliders for a while now, right? And we know that you can use this to produce the Z particle. Right? So, this is one of the fundamental particles in the standard model, right? The mass of this guy is 91 giga electron volts, right? And, and the width is 2.5 giga electron volts. Right? And this guy has many decay channels. A Z can decay, for instance, into quark, anti-quark, with a partial width, right, in two hadrons, which are the quarks represent being 1.7 GeV. So it decays into hadrons about 70%, 70% of the time, but it has other decays with decay width, so it can decay into uh, neutrinos, in this case the width, which is called invisible, because we cannot see these neutrinos, right, the escape detectors, it's 0.5 GeV, and it can also decay into leptons, which, for those that don't know particle physics, they, they, it could be the electron, for instance, it could be a neon, and, and, and the decaying to leptons is even rarer, it's like 0 0.08 GeV, so this accounts to about 20% of the decays, and this one about 9.9%, .9 and there are, there's like 0.1% missing here, which are even rarer decays of the Z. But if you add up all these widths, you get the lifetime of the Z, one over all those widths. Is, is the lifetime of the Z, right? And we can get an a expression similar to the bright wig uh, um, distribution in the relativistic case, too. All we have to do is to write an expression like this one. And now, this is one of those points where you have to believe me a little bit, right? This, this expression seems to be coming from nowhere. This is the four momenta, right? And, and um, for now, suffices to say that I can show eventually that the Feynman propagator of particles, unstable particles like those, will look like this one, right? There's a part of the propagator that will be this. And, and the important thing here is that for normally you would expect p squared to be the same as m squared, right? And, and then this part is zero. But that's not necessarily true for this propagator, right? We'll see that um, particles in, in quantum field theory, they can be on mass shell, which means p squared is equal to m squared, and then can be off mass shell. Uh, which means I'll be integrating over all values of p square, including those that are that are not equal to m square, and, and that means the relativistic dispersion relation will not be satisfied for all values of of p square, right? So, uh, what what I have to do here to to recover these these uh, bright Wigner distributions to look close to where p square go, goes close to, to be on shell. That's what produces that resonance, right? So I want to look the region where p square is very close to m square, and p and that means p0 goes close to Ep, which is the energy that satisfies the, the, the relativistic dispersion relation. In that case, right, I can write p square minus m square equal to p0 square minus p vector square 
minus m squared, right? This is EP minus EP squared, right? which allows me to write this as EP plus P0 and EP, actually, P0 minus EP. And close to this region, close to the peak of that distribution, this will be just 2 EP. And I want to keep this one because that's uh, the distribution I'm looking into. Right? And then I can write this uh, expression close to that peak as 1 over 2 EP times P0 minus EP. And then this part, which I just put a 2 EP factor out and this will be em over ep gamma over 2 which is very similar to that prime Wigner distribution i had before with the exception that now i have instead of gamma over 2 i have uh, instead of gamma right i over 2 i have in both i have m m e p gamma which is what you would expect for a, a relativistic particle because remember the lifetime is just one over lambda in this case the lifetime the half-life right will be just what e p over m one over gamma which is the same but now with a time dilation right this is the time dilation factor you would expect for a relativistic particle, right? So the time is, is living longer because it's uh, relativistic. And of course, because it's living longer, the width gets smaller, right? So this is the bright wigner distribution. Mm -hmm. and, and so we see that it, the bright wigner distributions appears exactly in the value where the particle is going on mass shell. It's becoming a real particle. We, we call these particles that are on mass shell real particles and the, the particles that are off mass shell as virtual particles. Right? This sounds uh, a little bit outrageous right now, I know, but we'll get to that. As I said, now you have to, to bear with me because, of course, just by what I said, it seems like I'm making up stuff. Right? But we'll see what virtual particles mean and how this, this expression can show up in the formal part of the calculation. But for now, what I want you to keep in mind is that eventually we'll be able to calculate this. And then this becomes an observable. I can actually calculate the 1 to n probabilities in my theory and, and calculate the waves and that's an, a, pre a prediction that we can then look at uh, scatterings in, or decays in particle physics and you see these nice peaks and you can measure the width right so this is really a physical quantity that you can calculate another observable now that we have these observables we have to find a way to relate them to the objects we have been developing on the uh, formal side, which are which are the, the green functions, the endpoint functions, the endpoint correlators, whatever you want to call them. I have to find a way to express these uh, uh, decay waves and uh, scattering cross sections in terms of those green functions. And in order to do that, First, I have to define a scattering in a language that is closer to those of, of, of these green functions. So, the way you start with that we, is imagining the following situation. I have, remember, I'm thinking about collision between particles now, right? I, I could start with any number of particles. Usually, it's just two of them because it's very hard to collide three particles at the same time, right? So, it's usually two particles coming towards each other. And they are isolated at the start, right? That means I need to start with wave packets that are localized enough. Normally, I know the energy of these particles. I know the momenta, but not so well that I make these into plane waves because then I don't know where the particle is. Right? So it's usually a state that is very narrow in momenta, 
but still localized enough that I can say that at least in the distant past, these two particles were isolated and I can define these initial states independently from each other. I can treat this particle as no interacting at the start, at least with each other, right? They are not interacting between themselves. These states I'll define in the Heisenberg picture, so I'll make states which are not time dependent, but of course there's an implicit time dependence because I'll define these as eigenstates of some operators, and operators themselves will evolve in time, right? This is what I call the in states, right? So for now I'm keeping phi i because I have any number of particles, but this usually will be just phi 1 and phi 2, right? It's just two particles, phi a and phi b, I think I'll call it pretty soon. And in states is implicit that it is, this is a Heisenberg uh, state, but it is defined as eigenstate of operators in the distance past. So it is implied here, let me put it in a different color, that this is a, a Heisenberg picture operator, but defined in some time uh, in the past, right? You can think of uh, the states in the limit where they are really, really narrow, right? If you, if you think there are basically infinitely narrow in momenta, then they become states like that. Of course, I don't want to do that. I want to, to keep them uh, at least having a, some space dependence so that I can say they are isolated. But I can think of these guys as superposition of many of those, right? Definite momenta states. In any way, in here means time is, is in the distant past. And then these two guys come towards each other, they interact and produce a number. And now I, 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 I really have to keep full generality here because particle collisions can really produce a, a lot of particles. So I, I can have a, a big number of particles in the end, but again, I assume that they will move away from each other and eventually they will be isolated enough that I can define out states again free from each other so they'll be independently defined and this is what i call the out states again i have now a, a, a set of states here that i i will keep general right because it can be any number and again out what is implied in out here is that i take in time in the distant future so far enough from the moment when the interaction happens, these are just isolated particles from each other. And this guy, of course, I can also I can also relate with uh, some uh, momentum, well-defined momentum states, just by thinking that this guy is some superposition of many well-defined momentum states, right? The tricky thing here is that while these are complete states, right? I can basically write uh, completeness uh, relations, both in terms of the in momentum states and the out momentum states <clears throat> I can write completeness relations both in terms of this guy and these guys um, the projection of one guy in this basis on guys on that other basis is not trivial because these are eigenstates of uh, of um, an operator that is evolving in time, right? And they are eigenstates of that operator at different times. So it's not trivial to project one into another. And that's exactly what I want to do, right? When I, I want to calculate the transition from this into this, uh, I'll have to write this as a superposition 
of the guys on the right here of the momentum states and I will end up with uh, matrix elements between these guys <coughs> this is not trivial this is what we have uh, to to worry about so one particle for one particle states this is pretty easy right if I want to write I a, a wave packet of one particle this is just something that looks like this right in full generality uh, I just have a momentum uh, integration this is hel the relativistic normalization I defined a few lectures ago I want to keep uh, all the states uh, with the normalization that is convenient for relativity um, this is a wave function and then I have some composition of momentum states right so this wave function will tell me everything about how localized is this state right uh, I have to satisfy some conditions so these needs to be normalized which also means that this guy uh, needs to be uh, normalized in this way right and of course in the case of the free theory we know how to express this guy right in the free theory then p in is equal to p out that is p right because i mean there's nothing that can happen with this one particle state and this we know how to write in terms of uh, creation operators in the vacuum right which is not very interesting because in the free theory there's no scattering you know, have to worry about the interacting theory in the case of two particles now I want to be build the in state I will specialize the in state for two particles initially right so I have just two particles now I have I can write something which is more complicated and and uh, the idea here is that I, if I look in the direction uh, which they are moving, in which they are moving towards each other, right? I have a state phi, let's call phi A, and another state phi B, right? And say I go to to uh, the frame of reference that they are going into that direction, right? So I. I have a line here, let's call it direction Z, in which they are moving. The, the, the key point here is that I don't, I, I don't have to worry a lot about Z because I'm throwing time to infinity, so they'll be very far away to each other. They are both moving the direction of Z, but it's, it's not true in general that the center of this distribution and the center of this distribution will pass on top of each other in this uh, perpendicular plane to the direction z right uh, this is is not necessarily true they can go through each other but have an overlap that is not exactly the same in this localization in space right and i i want to keep track of that because of course we know that if this overlap is zero, I mean they, they, they are the two centers are so far apart that the probability of actually uh, having some overlap between the wave functions becomes small. The cross sections should, of scattering should go to zero, right? So we want to keep track of this distance in the perpendicular plane uh, towards the direction of of the beams, let's say, right? I'll call this B and it's called the, the uh, impact parameter. Right? So then I will write the state of two wave packets as in as the the integral over the moment of packet A, the integral of momentum on packet B normalizations to EA to EB 
uh, wave functions. So this is a wave function for A, K A. This is a wave function for B. And then this, this part, which is the exponential of minus I B, say K B. Right? Notice, notice this is just a phase that I could absorb here. In fact, what I'm saying here is that there is a phase of phi A, a phase of phi B, and in general, the the if I make phi A and phi B uh, wave packet centered around uh, some position, right? Uh, the phase in general won't matter, but the difference between the difference between these phases can matter, especially in the perpendicular plane. I could leave this inside phi b and worry about about it later, but it's much easier to already take out the piece of this difference in phases that I actually believe will be important in this classical image that I have, right? Because in some limit. We know the system really re behave like fairly localized wave packets uh, crossing each other. Mm -hmm. So I remove that phase explicitly from phi b. I could have done it from phi a is the same, right? And then of course, k a and k b in, right? And this is uh, just momentum states at a distant past. Right? For the outgoing particles, let me just put a box around this one. For the outgoing particles, I don't have a, to worry about this impact parameter, right? There can be many of them, and it would be too complicated to, to worry about every possible geometry. I just la leave that inside the wave packets, right? And so I'll just define phi 1, phi 2, up to phi n, right? Some arbitrary number, number of outgoing particles. And then I have just this product over the final states of all the momenta e 3 pf over 2 pi cube. So I have many of these integrals. One wave function for each final particle, so P1, P2, P2, P3, Phi1, Phi2, Phi3, etc. Each of these come with a normalization to each of the integrals, right? And in the end you have, this is where the product ends, and, and, and of course I have out P1, P2, and so on. Right, so this is the outgoing state. So I will try to keep this convention of uh, of calling the in states A and B and use K for the moment of the incoming particles and uh, use 1, 2, up to N to the outgoing and use P for the outgoing uh, momentum. Right? So of course, if I want to calculate the transition from this into this, it will boil down minus these all these integrals and wave functions all to a, a, a bracket between the in momentum states and the out momentum states, right? All of these factors will be in front, but in the end, I'll have to calculate this bracket, right? And this is what is interesting, right? As I said, it's not trivial to project these uh, these into each other because despite being eigenstates of momenta, they are in the Heisenberg pictures and defined as eigenvectors of operators at different times, right? So I, I'm interested in this matrix element. Because I can plug that back and do whatever integrals need to be done. That's what I'm interested in. So to write things more explicitly, right? This is the limit of a time going big 
of this Heisenberg state P1, P2. And here, semicolon T means it's the Heisenberg defined at this time. Same thing here. Now I just have Ka and Kb, semicolon T. H, right? And of course, I can write this uh, into shredding a picture, just writing, just uh, like shredding a picture P1. Now it's P1 of T, P2 of T, right? Etc. Exponential of minus E H T. And this one, I can do the same, right? But now it's minus t here, so it will be also i h t k a k b. Shredding your picture, right? Which tells me this is equal which is fine right so that's almost the definition of the S matrix, right? So uh, the S matrix is uh, defined as this transition between these states. And of course, now I can take any T, right? Any time for this part of the, the calculation, in, in, including the time where I, I can I can choose the Heisenberg and the, the Schrodinger picture to, to coincide at a particular time and just take it as a reference time, and my initial condition or final condition, whatever, right? And, 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 and take this time to be any, right? And um, this is when the S matrix is defined, right? So this is the matrix that essentially does this job of connecting this Schrodinger picture states to each other, right? At the time where everything coincides, I'm taking the same time on both sides of, of the bracket, right? And, and this is by definition, this, this thing here, right? This is the same as these guys. Because I really didn't do anything here. The S matrix is then the limit of uh, this uh, evolution operator when past and, and future get distant from each other, right? The job of this matrix is to take this initial state, evolve it to the point where you can project it into this, this uh, future state, right? And these are elements, if you take all combinations of, uh, any combination of the initial and final states will be an element of this S matrix. Right? As an evolution operator, I need S, S dagger to be uh, unitary. I mean, S to be unitary, so S, S dagger, so S dagger S, which is equal to one, right? But of course I have more inside this S matrix than I want, because it, of course it is included here that the initial states are just free evolutions of uh, the final states are just free evolutions of the initial ones. There's no interaction, no scattering, right? So there's a part of S that is just a unity and I can make initial and final states the same, right? And, and that's not interesting. So I can define another matrix, which is called the T matrix, which is defined in terms of the 
uh, S matrix in this way. So I'm removing the identity from T. So the case where the states just go through each other and not interact at all is not included in T, it's included in 1. Right? And I have this uh, factor I here, which is just a convention and gives me properties for the T matrix that I, I find convenient. Right, and, and and that's how I define a T, T matrix. So now you can see that we'll be able to connect these matrix, these T matrix, to the events that we, as we defined before, right? We call the scattering event when something happens, and this will give, be given by this T matrix, right? When the T matrix between initial and final states, uh, it's not zero it means there's a scattering and uh, I also want to write this in a very particular way because I know that I know that momenta and energy need to be conserved All right so now I'm putting four momenta here and uh, and that means that I can write this uh, matrix element as Actually, as uh, this is just uh, conventional, it's useful, right? But I, I, I can remove from this definition explicitly the conservation of energy, the conservation of energy and momentum by writing this explicitly now I'm summing over all the final uh, for momentum and then I have this object which again I'm defining in this expression which is called the invariant matrix element right he, it is a matrix element of T, right? And as I, as I removed all the uh, part that is not Lorentz invariant from it, this guy will be a, a scalar, Lorentz scalar, which is very useful because you see the dynamics of the of the system. I mean, all the geometrical. Uh, facts is contained here, and I, I, I have here just uh, information about the interaction, which I can then calculate in, in any any uh, reference frame, which is very useful for me, right? So we'll be a lot of time trying to to calculate this guy. Besides, by writing uh, these matrix elements in this way, I'm also doing a nice physical separation of effects. Because you see, in order to get to this expression, I didn't tell you anything about the interaction. I didn't even write the Hamiltonian from the system. Which means that all the information that depends on the specific interaction that these uh, particles have must be contained inside M. Right, uh, so the whole dynamics is contained in in this invariant matrix element, while the kinematics, a good part of the kinematics, is already here. That thing that does not depend on the interaction right? it's just conservation of momentum and energy. Right, it fixes a lot of what can happen and what cannot happen in the scattering. Right, so I separated these two effects here, and that's also a nice thing. So now. Uh, we have two things to 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 show in order to finish this bridge between green functions and and cross sections, right? On one side, I I need to show you how cross sections can be obtained from this invariant matrix element, right? And on the other side, I, I have to show you how to obtain this matrix element from the green functions, right? Theory to experiment. Okay. Uh, this part of showing how the matrix element gets a cross-section, I can do it very rigorously, rigorously and I'll do that in the next lecture. The other part showing how the green functions lead 
to this matrix element is more complicated. So I give just a quick hint on how to do it right now, but we will only be able to prove this much later once we have uh, a much better set of tools in dealing with the theory. So the point here is what connect this matrix element with the green functions is what call uh, the LSZ reduction formula. Right? And let's let's take a look uh, at what this is. So suppose we already define green functions right, for this theory. In particular, we calculated the two-point green function, which is the propagator. One of them, we, we have seen the Feynman propagator, the retarded and the advanced propagators. Right? Uh, and, and now, let me write these green functions in momentum space. So I can take the Fourier transform of a, a, a green function in position, in field space, in order to get it in momentum. And so suppose I'm taking a green function of n points, in fact of n plus m points, where m is connected to the number of initial particles, and n is connected with the number of final particles. Right? And I, I want to calculate this g n plus m. Right? So this thing will depend, since I'm in momentum space, it will depend on p i mu momenta and k j mu momenta, right? J goes from 1 to m, and i goes from 1 to n, right? This is the final momenta, this is the initial momenta. And this is just a Fourier transform of the green function we know, so I'll write the Fourier transform. So it's a product of 1 to n for the final particles of d 4 x i exponential of i p i x i and and the same for the final momenta right and pi m this is m j 1 to m um, integral of the 4 y j exponential of minus i k j y j this these signs have to do with a convention i adopt for momenta we worry about that later it's not the important thing here and this is the green function of n points so phi x1 2 xn and phi y1 to y m order time order product and this is the vacuum so the the important thing to notice here is now i'm not using zero nor zero here because i'm talking about the full theory i'm not talking about the free theory anymore right so this uh, omega i'm using for the vacuum of the full interacting theory. So this is just the Fourier transform of this. Right? So the what the LSZ reduction formula tells us is that the S matrix elements, I mean the elements that I can relate to that M here, right? Uh, uh, I mean I get T and then I, I just have to remove this term, I have I remove the identity to get T, and then I remove a factor like this one to get M, right? So the elements of the S matrix N K J M in. So these are the elements of the S matrix S matrix are, are given by the limit when I take all 
momenta for the initial particles and put them on shell. I take all momenta of the uh, final particles and all, all momenta of the initial particles and put them on shell. Right? Of the following expression, I will explain what is what in a minute. So the square root of z, m plus n, product from i going to n of pi square minus m i square plus i epsilon times j going to m of k j square minus m j square plus i epsilon times g to the n plus m pi mu k k j mu right so this is the llc reduction formula let me try to get this properly boxed in And now let's try to just even superficially understand it, right? Of course, I cannot prove it right now. That we'll have to do by the start of quantum field theory too. But but for now, we can see some features here, right? So first, I'm putting all the final and initial states on shell, which is a first sign of uh, that I'm calculating a good thing because real particles, those those that you see in detectors, satisfy these uh, relativistic dispersion relation, right? Which is imposed by putting them on shell. On the other side, if you look here, it seems like I'm taking all these functions to zero, and I should get zero here, right? Just just taking this the same as this guy, this the same as this guy, so all this should go to zero. And the reason it doesn't is because the green function has propagators. So what we will show eventually is that this momentum space green function will have one propagator for each of these incoming or outgoing particles. And we have seen that the Feynman propagator, now you see the first hint of why the Feynman propagator is important for scalar field. Right? At least in the free, free case, is just this. So when I go into these limits, I basically, if this ring function has a product of many of these propagators, one for each of these particles, right? When I take this limit, I'm going exactly in in a place where this function that depend on a lot of these momenta is very singular is singular in every momenta i'm going to a pole in every momenta that the function depends uh, of right depends on and but the reason i don't get into trouble is because i'm multiplying by this so i'm removing the poles when i multiply by this essentially i'm looking at the residue of this uh, function of this uh, on this a uh, very singular point, right? I'm looking at the residue of the green function where every momenta is on its pole of the particles, the final part and initial particles are going to their poles. And this is the S matrix. Then you could ask about this square root of Z and, and, and the, the fact is that, again, this is not for the free theory, right? I'm talking now about the interacting uh, theory, which means we have calculated propagators for the free theory. But if I go to the complete theory, and this is a propagator in momentum space of the complete theory, instead of what we have before, that was 
let's put zero to say free theory, right? Was just I p squared minus m squared. And this m was the m in the Lagrangian. I'll put a zero to remember that, right? Now in the full theory, this will be I z p squared minus m squared plus I epsilon. And this m is not the one in the Lagrangian, not necessarily the one in the Lagrangian. So this is the one in the Lagrangian, this is not. If we will receive corrections, we'll see about that. And also this, this is, this, uh, there is this modification. So what's being uh, multiplied here is really the full propagator of the theory, which we'll learn to calculate uh, soon, sooner or later, right? But uh, uh, the point is, I don't want you to worry about that. In the limit where we, we're working at a, um, a leading order in the approximations we're going to make, right? You just you can use this expression just taking z equal to one and m equal to m zero. It means I just take the mass of the Lagrangian, right? And and we we're not even using this zero for now because it doesn't matter for us, right? So m is just m. In the Lagrangian, and and that gives us a way to uh, get the the S matrix elements. I just calculate green functions. If I'm doing a scattering of two particles into three, say two particles collide and produce three particles, I just have to calculate the five uh, the the five point correlator or the five point green function depending on five momenta and look at its most singular point and that will get me a uh, element of this matrix of course then I, I have to take away from this will include the chance of actually particles just going straight through each other and whatnot i have to remove that i have to look at the invariant part of it and then i get this number right so proving llc Sadly, it's something that you have to wait until we have done the full formal development of the interacting theories before I can actually prove that. But you can see where uh, the observables will come from. So now what is left, since I consider this, I know, but I consider this uh, a connection between the green functions that we can calculate to the S matrix element. Now I, I need to show how I can get from the S matrix element into the cross section. And we'll do that on the, on the next uh, video. So, so see you then.